Good afternoon, everybody. Apologies for being uh, slightly late. Um, so my name is Stephen Curry, and I am the Assistant Provost at Imperial for Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion. And I am delighted to welcome Chi Onwura uh, to the college to talk about the importance of diversity in STEM. And I'm particularly pleased that she's with us today, because today sees the publication of Imperial's new EDI strategy, which has been a major preoccupation of mine for the past several months and is the product of much consultation and discussion with many people um, all across Imperial. I'm not going to go into the details of the strategy document because you can download it from this link uh, on the web page uh, as of uh, this morning. Um, and I don't really want to take up uh, any more of the speaker's time. But uh, what this strategy represents for us is our determination as a university to be more courageous and more joined up in tackling the challenges of equality, diversity, and inclusion. Our determination to embed consideration of EDI into everything that we do and our determination to recognize that this is a responsibility that we all share, staff and students. Now, much of the work to deliver the strategy has actually already begun, and one of our first steps uh, has been to commit to applying for a Race Equality Charter Award, and the first phase of that work, which will be surveys of staff and students, begins today. The staff survey is open now, and the student survey will open in a few weeks' time on the 12th of November. Now, these surveys will be followed by focus groups and discussion so that we can really understand the perspectives of all staff, and we want all staff to um, complete the survey and students, on the experience of black, Asian, and minority ethnic people at Imperial. And I would encourage everyone here to please take the survey because your views and your experiences will really help to shape the action plan that we plan to create as part of our application. Now, if I go back to the strategy document um, for a second, you will see that at the bottom, in the middle section, um, one of our major commitments is to be open to dialogue and challenge on our work on equality, diversity, and inclusion. And that's precisely why we've invited Chi Onwura to speak to us today. Now, Chi is actually a graduate of Imperial College in electrical engineering. She also holds an MBA from the Manchester Business School and has over two decades, I hope you don't mind me saying, <laughs> experience working for a variety of mainly uh, private sector firms in various parts of the world. In 2010, she was elected as the Member of Parliament for Newcastle upon Tyne Central, and she is presently Labour's Shadow Minister for Industrial Strategy, Science and Innovation. She's also chair of the all-party parliamentary group on diversity in STEM and has long-standing interests in this area. Now, her opposite number in government is Sam Jima, uh, the Minister for University Science, Research and Innovation, and Sam has a habit of claiming that there's a major problem with free speech at universities in the UK. <laughs> I would like to reassure Mr. Jima that there is no such problem at Imperial College, and I have told Chi that she is free to say exactly what she wants. And so, without further ado, and perhaps with slight trepidation, I would like to invite Chi to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that. Thank you for that um, introduction. And uh, thank you uh, to uh, Imperial for inviting me here uh, to speak um, in uh, Black History Month. And it always amazes me, you know, how many uh, black people we see in Black History Month. You know, it's like they're all, we're all waiting outside somewhere off stage to be invited in. Uh, and I am looking forward to the day when that joke is not funny. <laughs> so, 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 so I'm Chion Wara. I have the huge privilege of representing uh, the people of um, Newcastle upon Tyne Central, uh, the city that I grew up in, and the people I grew up with. And the day, the, the, the day I was elected to be Member of Parliament in 2010 was probably the proudest day of my life. Um, though I was far too knackered to um, enjoy it, and uh, it happened about three o'clock in the morning. Um, but one of the other proudest moments of my life was the day which I was accepted into Imperial. 
And I remember very well, in fact, I came up to, I came to Imperial to hand in my acceptance because I was spending the summer in uh, London and I skipped down the walkway to the Lekeng building. That is how happy um, I was. And that, the, you know, it's because it's October, so it's probably 34, I think it's 34 years to the week, more or less, um, since I came to Imperial as an undergraduate student in, um, at the tender age of 19. And what that first day involved was sitting in a, um, sitting in a, a conference Oh, oh, not like this one, a conference room which was overwhelmingly white, male and privately educated lecture theatre uh, to learn the City in Guilds College song you know, in an atmosphere which I can now describe as a public school debating society uh, but at, I, I know what that's like now because I'm at in Parliament uh, at that time, having grown up in the socialist state of Newcastle, um, I wasn't familiar with it, but I was rather um, annoyed um, and a little intimidated, it's got to be said, to spend uh, two hours learning what was really a rugby song, but I was not daunted. And I wasn't daunted partially because I had been told I was part of the advance guard of what would soon be an army of female engineers that just as in medicine and in law, you know, professions which had been mainly male, um, engineering would become increasingly gender balanced. And back then, 12% of my fellow students were women. And today, you know, while women make up 43% of GPs and about half of solicitors, the proportion of female engineering students has, um, I think, well, one percentage point in that uh, 33 years. How does that feel for progress? Um, and you know, the lowest engineering in the UK has the lowest representation of women in Europe you know, at 10 percent. And figures are similarly poor, as you can see, when it comes to uh, black and minority ethnic, LGBTQ and working class engineers. Less than 0.5% of respondents to Stone Places, Stonewall's Workplace Equality Index work for engineering firms, while only 6% of engineers are BAME, compared to 14% of the population. Working class pupils, meanwhile, are less likely to have specialist science teachers at school, which you all know is important, and will do up to 25% worse than their middle class peers and are less likely to study engineering as a consequence. And this monochrome picture of depressingly slow progress is reflected across, you know, across STEM, science, uh, technology, engineering and maths, although the life sciences have performed much better than the physical sciences in gender diversity. And this has an impact on people's lives, everyone's lives, and their ability to take part in, you know, in the workplace. You know, this is my workplace now. And I often say, yeah, that's actually, that's, a, uh, that's one of the, um, that is actually the smoking room in the Palace of Westminster, and I don't spend much time working in there, but that was, that's, a, that's, a, that's a photograph of the BAME, uh, Labour BAME uh, members of Parliament. And I often say that Parliament is the most diverse environment I have ever worked in. And that surprises people because our representative body is not known for its representativeness. Um, and then I say that I worked as an engineer for two decades and everybody understands. You know, as an engineer, I was so often the only black person in the room, the only woman in the room, the only working class person in the room, the only northerner in the room, the only socialist in the room, and the only Newcastle United fan. <laughs> So it wasn't the latter that made me feel an outsider, though it often does, you know, you know, and that is quite a lot of difference to own. 
And to be honest, it took me a long time to learn to own it. You know, it's really important to understand and own your, 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 your identity. You know, as a child growing up in Newcastle, I certainly experienced a lot of racism. And this was in the 70s and 80s. But it never came from adults around me. And my mother made, me, uh, made it absolutely clear to me that I was everyone and anyone's equal. And the teachers in the fantastic state school, Kenton School, that I went to, which is still in my constituency now, they were dedicated purely, it seemed, to trying to get impart upon me the maximum amount of knowledge and skills, you know, that was possible. I have to always say thank you to the fantastic teachers that I had, and I think they need to be better, <laughs> better paid now. Um, but so, and I also think that as a as a Irish Nigerian Geordie, um, I had a head start because it was clear to me from an early age that I was unlikely to spend my life with people exactly like me. Okay? And that it was, as a consequence, I think that it was better to learn from others than to seek to impose my view of the world on everyone else. And I think that those who grow up in uh, more uh, monocultural environments uh, don't necessarily see that. So it's not just, so, so I didn't, you know, I didn't expect engineering to be diverse, if you like, after my experience. Uh, I knew, if you like, some of the, I knew some of the statistics, but I think what people may find, what others, you know, other people find it diff difficult sometimes to understand is just how tiring being the only one uh, can be. Uh, um, I would go to conferences on um, broadband and uh, spectrum because that was, I was a telecoms engineer. Um, I'd go to conf I would be speaking at a conference with 2,000 people in the room and I would be the only black woman speaking. So everyone would rep remember me. I wouldn't remember anyone. <laughs> and as a consequence, people would think I was rude because I couldn't remember everybody's name. But, you know, I was... I was memorable, which has some advantages to it, but ultimately it's a, it's a very isolating and exclusive experience. And I also needed to learn to understand, you know, that when I walked into a room, and I felt that I was just walking into a room, just me, there was actually a lot which entered that room with me, or rather there was already in the room, rather there was a lot that was already in the room but were effectively barriers for me. So assumptions about black people, assumptions about Nigerians, assumptions about women, Geordies. Really it was like an episode of, of Sherlock. Have you seen Sherlock where you see what's, go what's going on in Sherlock Holmes' mind? But what would be swirling around me were people's stereotypes um, rather than my actual experiences. Uh, assumptions that they might, people wouldn't make explicit. In fact, often did not make explicit, but, you know, was English my first language? Was I really a qualified engineer? Should be said that having Imperial on your CV generally tends to answer that one. Um, and then later, you know, when, you know, was Newcastle, I was asked the question, was Newcastle ready for its first black MP? Or would I only represent black people in my constituency? Now, I think it's really important to recognize and acknowledge the challenges of those kinds of unconscious and sometimes conscious bias. But it's important to do that without internalizing them. And I also think it's important to remain authentic to yourself. So don't succumb to the blame and you know, to the blame and change the, the victim culture. I, for one, am certainly not going to be leaning in anywhere. No. But I do think it's important to recognize that diversity is an economic imperative. You know, it's a collective challenge. It's not all on the individual. You know, that was true during my two-decade career as a professional uh, telecoms engineer, and it's even truer now. <laughs> now that technology has eaten up just about every part of our lives. Uh, diversity isn't a nice to have. 
Um, as Shadow Minister for Industrial Strategy, my job is to deliver good, well-paid, productive, high-skilled jobs for everyone across the country and making, you know, the, the UK into an innovation nation. And so diversity is an absolute prerequisite of that. And it is my job to make that prerequisite a reality. So science and innovation are at the heart of Labour's industrial strategy and for a good reason. You know, uh, we, w we want to build an innovation nation. That means closing the UK's productivity gap and making an economy that works for everyone. And STEM jobs pay better. You know, that is one of the reasons for the gender uh, pay gap is because STEM jobs pay better and women aren't in them. And um, with STEM jobs projected to be created at twice the rate of other jobs over the next five years, it's absolutely essential that they're open to everyone and benefit from the talents of everyone. Yeah. So what is going wrong? So, you know, while the gap between boys and girls taking science at GCSE has actually been eliminated and girls are performing better on average, we still see it in A-levels with only a fifth of physics students female, for example. And I've also t already talked about the lack of, of um, the le how working class and BME students are less likely to have science specialist teachers. And study shows that uh, teenagers, you know, especially those girls and those from minority groups, are more likely to engage with science and engineering if they have what's called science capital in their lives. And we know we need to equip teachers to make this difference, to provide experience and knowledge of science to girls and ethnic minorities and those from underrepresented groups so to encourage them to persist with science. So Labour said that we will reverse the cuts to schools which have hit, hit STEM teaching and career advice. And we'd also set up a national education service which would mean, and I know some of you will be paying student fees, but it would mean that education was free at the point of use from the cradle to the grave. And that is so important because many, those who don't have science capital particularly, may not choose it when they're 16 or 18, but they should have the opportunity to choose it later in life. Uh, right now, in this country, unless you are rich, you know, the opportunity to, for, uh, to, for education ends once you're 24. So that is also why um, Black History Month is so important, because that is, um, you know, as a child, I would have been hard put to name a dozen famous black people outside of music and sports. You know, my knowledge of black achievement was limited to those two sectors. And a few walk on parts in the sort of the histories of great nations generally as hapless villains or stereo, hapless victims or stereotypical villains. Where whilst I also suffered from what I now call um, Marie Curie syndrome, which is the inability to name more than one female scientist. Uh, so that is why. Black History Month and Ada Lovelace Day, it matters so much, you know. Yes, it's important to tell the stories of those who's, who history has overlooked, but it's also the very practical power of showing the diversity of achievement that is our history and should even more so be our future. So you just think about films such as Hidden Figures, which did so well at the box office a couple of years ago and inspired millions by telling that untold story, or TV shows. And it's really interesting that three times as many girls watched Jodie Whittaker's first Doctor Who episode than watched last year's season opener. And I hope that with a <laughs> with a made in Sheffield sonic screwdriver, Jodie Whittaker can encourage, can make a real difference actually in encouraging um, girls to see that science and engineering is for them. You know, she can be the exciting, creative, scientific role model that girls need. You know, but we can't just rely on um, the media. 
um, to we need to build bridges between schools and industry. There are fantastic groups already doing this from um, Let Toys Be Toys to this is the Association for Black Engineers UK who have a program called Transition um, and also another one called Make Engineering Hot which is you know, m working to overturn perceptions among young people that science is for the pale and male and privileged. But we also do need government to play a role too, and I've been really disappointed by um, Minister's response earlier when I raised this issue of helping business, industry and schools to engage with each other. Right now there are 600 different initiatives for industry and schools to engage with each other. We need something which is organising and signposting that so that both schools and business, you know, can make the best use of their time. Now, and at that school, then there's also a higher education. And I like to say, and this generally strikes the fear of God into college deans, but I can talk, I can tell within 90 seconds of walking into a university engineering department whether the staff take diversity seriously or simply as a tick box exercise. And I'd say unfortunately, despite the success of initiatives like Athena Swan, too many in leadership positions still don't show real leadership. Only 85 professors out of 20,000 in 2015 were black, while only a fifth were women. And I won't accept the excuse that schools aren't producing enough good women or minority ethnic students, not when the university system is so clearly failing. Just as a, as a, as a question, um, who can tell me what that is? Does anyone tell me what that is? Great. Okay, yeah. That, yeah. that is the backbone network for Nigeria's first GSM network. Um, I know because I designed it and helped roll it out in Nigeria. And what, you know, if there was an entrance exam for Imperial which was based on recognizing Nigeria's backbone network, you know, there would be a lot more students here from Nigeria and, and from other, and from Nigeria or with Nigerian heritage. And what I'm saying is that the questions that people are asking are often loaded to the experiences of those who are asking the questions when universities and others are interviewing. And I think it's really important to make sure that, um, that uh, they do not reflect uh, cultural uh, bias. I should say, I, uh, my understanding is that that is still, is still running, still working, still over congested, but that was how it was designed to be. Um, and so, um, you know, and you know, to talk a little bit about my own experience here, which has perhaps made me, which is what makes me quite outspoken, it was, it was pretty negative. Uh, I um, um, in the second year when I was here, I wrote an article for the Guard, Guardian, where I talked about, I talked about what it was like to be a black female engineering student in an almost exclusively male science. Uh, for faculty, um, citing a couple of racist <laughs> jokes from the rag mag when I was here, from IC rag mag. And this is uh, the report that Felix <laughs> printed at the time, which I think was 1988 or something. Uh, but there was almost, there was absolutely no recognition, you know, that, um, the, you know, the, um, so I remember it, the School of Mines had a lesbian sex show for its strip show sorry not sex strip show as part of its annual um celebration and uh racist jokes in the rag mag were uh common now i i, I say this not simply to you know because it's history because I'm, i understand and having met uh the president of imperial today you know that um you know imperial has has changed hugely and hugely in the time that I haven't been here, um, and that it is, and as we heard, the launch of the diversity and inclusion um, strategy. But I think it's important to recognise that that sort of stuff still matters because it has informed it, the um, the experience of engineers who are my age or even a bit younger in terms of their training. And it's one of the reasons why they are less engineers, uh, less f less fewer women engineers. Because I have to say, there were many times when I was here when I thought of leaving Imperial to study something else, but. 
Um, it was the idea of not being an engineer uh, which stopped me from, from leaving. And um, the only other thing I, I could think of to study actually was law, and I really did not want to be a lawyer. <laughs> so, um, you know, bullying and prejudice continue to affect women and minorities in STEM subjects beyond their student years. So many graduates and early year career researchers report widespread bullying and harassment, which has a long-term impact on their career intentions. For female chemistry PhD students, for example, the intention to pursue a research career drops by almost a half between the first and third year of their PhD, but it only changes by 2% for men. So something is happening there. And the Campaign for Science and Engineering found earlier this year that only 46% of black engineering graduates are in full-time jobs within six months of leaving university, as opposed to 71% of white graduates, and that this gap has increased in the last two years. So Labour is looking at ways to specifically support early, year, early career researchers because the, the lack of stable um, employment contracts, it's an issue of employment contracts, and you know, we're, we're supporting the action taken by gig economy workers such, in, such as Uber workers to establish proper employment contracts, but in early early career researchers have no stability of employment and that has a disproportionately detrimental effect on women and minorities, um, I would argue. So to make the science sector truly inclusive, we need a comprehensive sector-wide approach. And the next Labour government will introduce diversity charter challenges for each sector to ensure that all companies in sectors take diversity seriously. And this will involve tying diversity targets to salary and rewards and ensuring that diversity is embedded in everyday practice. If it's not diverse by design, it will be unequal by outcome. So diversity is at the heart of labour science and innovation agenda. But things aren't going to change consistently for the better until politics itself is truly diverse and inclusive. It's the most diverse parliament that we've ever had in the UK. We've got more women, more LGBT MPs, and we have 51 black and minority ethnic MPs. But it's still not representative of the country. And I always say that in parliament, as a, as a, 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 I am followed around the corridors of power by dead white men in tights. <laughs> I'm talking about the paintings and the statues, though there are some in the chamber as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So less than a third of MPs are women. Well, obviously we make up half the uh, population, and there are still fewer BAME and LGBTQ MPs in percentage terms than there would be if, the, if, if it was representative, and there are still only five disabled MPs. And that matters. It matters as a fundamental point of democracy. Uh -huh. But it also matters as a practical point, because if our legislation and our economy is designed by a narrow section of society, it will reflect their concerns. And I'm going to finish with an, you know, with an example from technology. Now, how many of you have uh, iPhones or iPads? Oh, it's less than 50%, so the rest of you are, are Android, are you? Very good, I'm Android. All right, but so, um, so I don't know whether you use the, um, the health app, uh, the uh, Apple health app, and when Apple were designing that, um, they wanted to make sure that it took in and monitored all the relevant data that would you know, reflect someone's health. health. So obviously exercise, um, Obviously, um, you know, um, diet, uh, sleep, um, you know, um, temperature, pulse, evening. So all the potential indicators of wellness. And it did, um, if you were a man. They forgot about periods. <laughs> and the reason they forgot about periods is because nobody in the design team had them. <laughs> uh, and whilst, you know, you know, 
that's a that's a very sort of visible example of a, <laughs> of, a of exclusion. But what I, my point is that that is happening all the time in other areas, in policy development and technology. We will never know the kind of fantastic technology we would have if the you know if if technology was designed by more representative of humanity, then it would necessarily be more humane. And until we have proper representation of you know, representativeness in Parliament and in tech and engineering, we are not going to be able to say that we have an equal society. So finally, then, you know, history is written by the victors. And that, you know, the pen is in the hands of those in power. And that is why it is all too often his story rather than her story. And it doesn't reflect the achievements or the ambitions of black and minority, ethnic, LGBTQ, disabled and other minorities. You know, this October, you know, uh, uh, Black History Month and following A Day Lovelace Day, it, we have an opportunity to hear the stories of those who have in, actually, you know, invented our world in all its glory and diversity. But it's also an opportunity to consider what we want the future of our sector to look like and to make UK science and engineering truly diverse and inclusive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chi, and uh, we still have some time before the hour is up. Uh, I believe this room is booked for a lecture at three o'clock, so I don't want to dis um, uh, disadvantage the students. Uh, but we have a couple of roving mics, and so uh, if people have questions, then please put your hand up. <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the interest of time, could I ask people to ask questions that are pithy and to the point, and that are questions rather than more of a comment? Uh, we have. A gentleman here and a lady in the middle. There was some, she, oh, somebody the lady right at the, the back. back put her hand oh, right at the back. Oh, definitely. right at the back she, first. She please. put her hand up before I'd finished speaking. Oh, oh okay, <laughs> okay. That's clearly urgent. Sorry? We'll try to, yep. I'll be very quick. Just um, say hi, Shi. Um, it was nice to see you again last time I saw you when you were talking about this at the Houses of Parliament, if you remember. Um, two things. Um, one thing about um, diversity and inclusion is, for example, if you are a black woman and you apply for a role and you get it, you usually get it because you're really, really good. Um, and um, one of the difficulties is, is if you have problems, because you feel that kind of weight on your shoulder of um, being uh, somebody of um, achievement, you might not feel as comfortable going to somebody who might not be somebody who is of colour mm. to explain to them that you're not doing um, very well. And I wondered what your views were on that. And the second thing is that, um, what are your views on um, having um, role models in universities? So we're talking, for example, at Imperial, about attracting um, um, young people in STEM as well. But if there aren't enough um, black female lecturers, I know at UCL that there's a drive now to get more um, female lecturers, black female lecturers. If there aren't, then how can we actually say that we are actually signing up to this um, race thing and actually trying to encourage young women if they don't see those role models and they don't think um, it's achievable? Okay. Oh, well, those are two really good points. I mean, firstly, when it comes to um, yes, yeah, you know, the, the the sense of the isolation of uh, being a um, sort of a high achiever or an achiever and having no one that looks like you in your in your sort of peer group or, or above you, and that's why I think networks, you know, networks and you know, you know mentors, but but networks, um, and I, I hope you have a. a, a student network and the staff network here to support um, you know, BAME and other and other groups be, to exchange experiences and also um, to um, to learn from experiences so that uh, you can um, talk about the reality of your of your role because everyone meets challenges um, in the, in their role. I know exactly I know exactly what you're talking about there. And then secondly, yeah, as I said, you need you do need role models. You need to see something to have a chance to be it and. You can't, um, you know, um, one of the reasons why the Labour Party introduced all women shortlists uh, was because we had seen
that um, at the rate of the increase of women in Parliament, it would be 2,375 before we had a gender balanced Parliament. Yeah, and we weren't prepared to wait that long. So you need to, you need, you, you, there needs to be support measures to ensure that you get, that you have some role models in place. Uh, question yeah. here. Hi, hi, G. Hi. Um, so last time I saw you actually was at a network, so that's the B, King's College BME Early Career Research right. Conference, and that was great because it was a chance to be with people who were like you, exactly as you were talking about seeing people chance network. I wanted to ask you about um, the government's announcement today of the ethnicity pay gap mm -hmm. proposal. Um, now they've done it with a gender pay gap mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to know your thoughts as to whether that would actually make a difference, have an impact, do you think this is the sort of thing that needs to be done and if so what do we do with that information and data? Okay, that's another really great question. So I, I talked a little bit about the diversity um, challenge charters that we would uh, there's the charter challenges that we would that we would um, put in place and that we announced those back in um, I think it was March and that would one of the things we said that would include ethnicity monitoring because I, I believe that monitoring you know I'm a, I, I, did, I did a lot of stats here at Imperial and actually even more in my MBA and I believe that statistics and monitoring and you know evidence base you know let's have an evidence base but is, is really important but it's not enough because you have to tie something to that so it's all it's all very well say you know year on year saying oh it's really bad we're going to do better next year but you need to tie something to that so you need to it needs that's why I say you know the results need to be tied to um, you know to the board salaries or for example you know a kite mark which meant that consumers or, or uh, customers could see the, the companies and the businesses who are doing better than others in this area and the universities who are doing better than others in this area. So did I hear correct on the radio this morning there was talk about publishing a diversity pay gap? An ethnicity, pay, ethnicity gap. Yes, pay gap. Yes, yes. For companies, I think it was over 250, 250. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the same model as same for the model general pay gap. Uh, question here. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm from China. I'm the first year PhD student in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And uh, I know you because at the early of this year, I was in the House of Commons for an event called the Voice of the Future 2018. But everyone knows me here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you and the Minister Sam Gayum was speaking to us. Right. So I know you. And uh, my right. question is for the draw for the international student here. And uh, probably you may have known some international students. Uh, they are imperial. They are extremely smart. And they got very high, uh, high skills. But when they graduate, they, they are coming to UK to find a job. Uh, the, the employer will tell, you, tell them, you are really smart, but we cannot give you the offer position because sponsor you spent a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, what will the next labor government to do to solve this problem. <laughs> well, that's another, you've just got great questions here. Um, so I know, I mean, obviously, this, go, oh, not this government, or the last government, before, changed the, uh, vi some of the visa, student visa require, you know, requirements so that um, students couldn't work afterwards, after graduating for as long. And we're looking at that, but, m but more specifically, you know, we're saying that um, our, um, our migration policy will not be based on an arbitrary figure. It will be based on economic need. And it will, as part of our, our innovation strategy, recognizes that innovation happens, as I believe passionately, innovation happens when people from different backgrounds, different disciplines, you know, includes different countries, different experiences, come together to create something new. So we will be, you know, we will not be um, we will not. We will be. We will not be excluding people from um, our economy and from make, creating great innovation because they're from, you know, China or for, or from wherever. You know, the, part of what's driving. I mean, and I speak, speaking as a constituency MP, I get applications for uh, to hurry up visas all the time. And the, currently, the Home Office particularly is using delay as a form of um, of numbers management. You know, and we will change that. We have a question here at the back. 
So it's really great to see that lots of initiatives are taking place to address the problems in um, diversity, but inevitably a lot of these end up falling on the shoulders of people from minority groups. Um, what are your views on how you can address that and how you can draw people from non-minority yeah. groups to actually help with these initiatives and reduce that burden? Yeah, no, that's another, that's another great question because um, that's what I particularly meant by saying that diversity, it's not, it shouldn't fall on the shoulders of the individual. I am not going to, as what's her name, lean in. You know, it is a collective responsibility. And so specifically to, you know, and you talk about specifically these diversity um, charter challenges will have, will have sectors, will be led by sector leads signing up to specific um, things that, every, that all companies will have to do and particularly um, identifying on boards. Is it, is, is, is it an example in the finance industry, the finance chart, gender charter, identifying on boards somebody who's responsible for making it happen, you know, because you're, you're absolutely right and this is in you know, this, uh, this is not the responsibility of those who are already facing barriers. This is the responsibility of those in, in, who have the power. A uh, question from the grey-haired student in the front. <laughs> <laughs> hi, 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 um, just to follow up on the excellent question uh, from the gentleman to my left, would, will Labour bring back the, um, the two-year post-study visa, which I know many yeah. people have benefited from, including ourselves at Research Fortnite? Yeah, um, we, we haven't um, completed our write, writing of the manifesto, though obviously we know there could be an election at any time, but um, it is something, <laughs> and the sooner the better, you know, but it is something that we're, that we're looking closely at, and I, you know, speaking for myself as innovation shadow rather than home office shadow, it is something that I would support. Thank you, and we have a question here, two Hello. thirds of the way back. I don't actually, I didn't know you until today. <laughs> <laughs> Great, it's nice to meet someone. <laughs> um, so I'm a PhD student in physics, and my desire to continue in academia has plummeted. <laughs> um, Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so In a way, I feel like I'm betraying all of the women who were coming after, um, and in a way, I, I feel like I should be a mentor to them. Mm -hmm. but I'm leaving. So why are you leaving? Why? <laughs> well, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. No, I, write to me. Write to me afterwards. It's just like it, it took a toll on my mental health. Right. Um, and I was wondering if you have any advice uh, with anything related to maybe how not to feel guilty about it. And, if there's anything I can do, I don't, anyway. Well, I, well, so I mean, the responsibility, and this is, you know, the, the thing I always say to the Royal, for example, the Royal Society, and other, not just the Royal Society, let's be clear, it's also the IET and others who have, like, Royal Society, I think 93% of its fellows are male, you know. Um, it's not up to women like yourself to, re to redress that. You know, the Royal Society did not Im admit women for, in, for the first, I think, 200 years of its existence. So it's not, it is not up to you to address it. So it's not your responsibility. So you should not feel, you should not feel guilty. You know, it is something that is not your responsibility. The system has um, evolved in such a way that women have been and are excluded and barriers are there. And of course, they, um, they, they make themselves, they make themselves felt. But I do think, you know, I do. I would encourage you to share your experience and what could be done to improve the experiences of others, regardless of whether you are here or you know, whether you are in academia or not. And I do know, for example, because I talk regularly to the Institute of Physics, and they are looking, you know, and they're they're looking at this. They're desperately looking at this, you may say, because their, their figures are so bad. So um, it would be. I think you should share, share your experience and no, don't don't feel guilty. We have a little bit of time left. Uh, hang on, can you just wait for the microphone and we'll bring it right to you. So we've been forgetting to repeat the question. Uh, uh, sorry. Yes, sorry. I was a PhD student, female from ethnic minority, and I had similar problem. As a PhD student, we all know that we go through up and down. So I had 
really down, really down period. I ended up in the hospital, but I did finish my PhD. But this is the story of most of the PhD students that is, there is one point when you feel that you just want to <laughs> get out of it and do whatever, or into a jungle or whatever. So this is part of PhD. <laughs> well, maybe, <laughs> okay, well, we, have, we may have an issue with uh, <laughs> Well, I think many of us who have PhDs would agree wholeheartedly with that, <laughs> but hopefully most have a happy outcome. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm a postdoc at Chemical Engineering. I finished my PhD here as well. It's more or less a follow-up on a different topic. I didn't want to continue in academia until recently because it intimidated me. Because by, let's say, public vote, you need to have a very competitive publication record, you need to have international standing, and so on, like go through different institutions. So in my head, it really didn't match with the profile of having a family, which is something I would also like to have. So I would like your opinion on this. I mean, I'm, I decided to give it a shot, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to see where it leads me to. But I feel like I'm expressing the opinion of many fellow women mm, who might mm. discuss. Um, I think that, so this is a question about um, you know, the impact of, on, on women of the, of the, um, the nature of um, currently um, early uh, career research. And I think, that's some, I, I think that's something that has to change. Um, I think I, you know, having a series of short-term contracts is not conducive for any kind of uh, family life, really, and and you know, for men or for women, and um, it's also not conducive. I mean, I've seen the studies that say that this is a call is a is an important factor in mental health issues um, in the um, in early early uh, um, careers, early research careers. So I think it's something that ha I think it's something that the academia, the sector, has to address. And I am looking and actively looking for suggestions and proposals uh, to, to, to do that. And I think having, obviously having longer term contracts would help, but there should be some form of um, structured career support. I know there's a, there's a fellowships, increasing fellowships, which aren't tied to a particular project, but um, you know, I'm, I, you know, it's, something that it's, something, it's a systemic issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. We're going to have to wrap things up. I know there are hands left, but I'm very sorry we're out of time. And I just want to invite our Vice Provost for Education, Professor Simone Boitendijk, uh, to give a brief vote of thanks, hopefully without tripping on the stairs. <laughs> if you speak here. <laughs> so, so thank you so much, G, for this amazing speech. And I, I want to highlight two things that really struck me. One is that you spoke so well to the individuals who feel under, um, undervalued and underprivileged, and it was clear from some of the responses in the audience that you really struck a chord there. Um, I want to speak to all of you who asked a question afterwards and spoke about some personal issues and see what we can do. Um, but I think what you also did really well is merge in and out of looking at the problem also from the system level. And for me, as a person in leadership in the university, working very closely with Stephen, who's also trying to approach equality, diversity, and inclusion at the system level, I think that's something we should never forget, that this is not an issue for individuals to solve. It's certainly not an issue for underrepresented individuals who already have a hard time making it because it costs too much time and effort. And I totally agree with you. I think leaning in is not a message we should give to anybody. <laughs> we need to change the system. And those were actually your last words before I came up. And I think that really is the way to look at it. It also brings in um, white people, males, um, because in order to change the system, we all need to change. And we need to tell people that face bias and face discrimination, that we see them, we hear them, and we're ready to take action. And even just saying that, I think, already takes a lot of the pain out of everybody's situation. Because if you feel like you face bias, and if you know there are hurdles on your path that other people don't have, and you know the meritocracy isn't really working, and you raise your hand and tell your stories, and then you get the pushback 
that no, our system is meritocratic. There really is only <laughs> one conclusion, namely, I'm clearly not good enough. And that's the last thing that we as a university want to tell our absolutely brilliant students and young staff, you're all good enough. And we need to make sure that you all have a level playing field and that you all have an opportunity to bring out your absolute best talents. And I think that's why it's so important to look at this from a system level. And that's why I'm so proud we have an EDI strategy now. We will be working with all of you. No one can, can turn away and say it's not for them. And that's the last thing I want to address, which also came out very clearly in your speech, that diversity is good for everybody. It's not just good for people who have it, have a harder time than others in an already very, very competitive, difficult academic environment. It really is good for everybody. And I'm absolutely convinced if we create a more equal, more diverse, more inclusive imperial, we will be a gentler, kinder university for everybody. And I think in many ways we'll be more excellent, we'll contribute more to the global issues, and we'll just be a better university. And thank you for telling us how to get there, telling us your stories. It was incredibly courageous. I wish you a lot of luck in your work, whether you're Labour is going to be elected or not. I'm, I'm, I'm neutral. I'm from the Netherlands. I, I see things, but I don't have a position on this. But I, I really I hope that you'll continue your work. You continue to be visible for all of us. And I hope you'll come back and, and keep teaching us how we should be. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much. She has to run to catch a train to the greatest city in England.